We continue our series in Mark's Gospel, so go ahead and grab your Bibles, heading to Mark chapter 5. If you're new to the Bible, you're going to the New Testament, which is in the second half of your Bible, and it's one of the four Gospel accounts right at the beginning, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. We're going to Mark chapter 5. Uh, over the last few weeks, we've been looking at snapshots, almost cameos of Jesus and his teaching. We have covered many parables and their explanations, and various different trials that Jesus Jesus and the disciples have gone through. However, in Mark's typical fast-paced uh, style, he gives us very little detail over each of these scenarios. However, today, as we look into chapter 5, we're going to see Jesus healing a demon-possessed man. And unusually for Mark, he's going to give us quite a lot of detail and quite a lot of time in this scenario. What I want to suggest is that in doing this, there is something suggestive in the, the actions of Jesus or the scenario that we're going to learn about to the deity of Jesus. Something about Jesus healing the demon-possessed man tells us that Jesus is the Son of God. Because that is the aim of Mark. In Mark 1.1 1, 1, he declares it, that he wants us to know that Jesus is the Son of God. So something in this passage in Mark chapter 5 is most significant in telling that principle. As we go through the passage we're going to learn a few things. We're going to learn that everyone matters in the kingdom of God. Nobody is worthless and all should be given equal opportunity to hear the gospel message. That means for those who already know Jesus, we have a task and it's a gospel sharing mission and it's a mission for our lives. It will involve risk, it will be costly and it will even be exhausting. But it is the mission of our lives to lead as many as we can to our Lord Jesus Christ. I hope today that you are eager for God's word because I think this is an incredible passage and I look forward as we now go into the word of God and into the verses that we're going to be studying. So we're going to Mark's gospel chapter 5 and we're going to begin in verse 1. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes, and when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with unclean spirit. And we started chapter four with Jesus teaching parables along the coastline of Capernaum. After a long day teaching, he wished to go to the other side of the sea, to the other, other coastline on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. At last week, we looked at that journey from Jesus getting into the boat at Capernaum, heading to Gerasenes at the other side, there was a great storm. And in this great storm, we learned that Jesus was in control, that he calmed the storm and that the disciples and him were saved. There's nothing to note uh, that the journey continued, but we know by um, Mark chapter 5 that they arrive in Gerasenes. Nothing significant to note of this coastal village. It's small. It doesn't have any great significance. It seems that it carries little significance in the region. What we do know is that it's based in the Gentile region, a non-Jewish region of the land. It's unpretentious, known for nothing and a quaint little village that Jesus and the disciples arrive in. Upon arriving, Jesus stepped out of the boat and was met by a man, whom we are told lived in the tombs or in the kind of coastline uh, crags, in, in the caves along the coastline. Uh, clearly, this individual didn't live with the community in this small village town of Gerasenes. Instead, he has chosen or has been forced to segregate himself into the coastline and we're told why because he has an unclean spirit that has possessed him meaning he is possessed by the devil by the demons by the spirits of satan verse 3 he lived among the tombs and no one could bind him anymore not even with a chain for he had often been bound with shackles and chains but he wrenched the chains apart and he broke the shackles in pieces no one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. These verses give us a little bit of insight of what it meant to be possessed by an evil spirit. 
the spirit was strong it couldn't be contained and, and even when they tried to with the heaviest chains they could find it would break free and this man would continue to be possessed by these uh, spirits he was known to go up and down the coastline and he was known to do two things to cry out or to wail out he was known for his crying his tears he was known for his wailing because it was painful painful to be possessed by this unclean spirit the second thing he was known for was uh, self-harm that he was cutting himself with stones that the pain he could not endure and so he meant to self-harm to get through the days and the nights there is no let up he is being tortured by these unclean evil spirits and this a description we get in verses 3, 4 and 5 give way to a comparison later on as we look a, a little bit further ahead about what Jesus will do in his life but we're not going to go to that yet we'll come to it in a while for now just turn your attention to verse 6 and when he saw Jesus from afar he ran and fell down before him and crying out with a loud voice he said what have you done with me Jesus son of the most high God I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, come out the man, you unclean spirit. To understand correctly, we kind of need to jump about a little bit in these verses. At beginning verse 6, this um, demon-possessed, evil spirit-possessed man is running to Jesus, likely across the beach. The reason is actually in verse 8 because Jesus is commanding the evil spirit to come out of the man. From afar, Jesus knows that he is possessed by a spirit and he is commanding the spirits to leave this man. Notice that in verse eight, he directs the commandment to the spirit. He is speaking to the spirit rather than the man. And in response, we get verse seven, that the man was running towards uh, Jesus and he was declaring aloud that Jesus is the son of the most high God. And just kind of breaking this down a little bit more, we see three really important developments. Number one is there is a question. What have you to do with me? Is the question, or put simply, what are you going to do? What are you going to do with me? The spirit recognises that Jesus is different, that there's something different about him other than the disciples or everyone else they have seen. They recognise that there is some form of authority in Jesus. Could it be that the spirit has found someone that they cannot overcome, that will overcome them instead? The second thing I want you to see is the name. And notice that the Spirit declares the identity of Jesus, that he is the Son of the Most High God. And I don't want you to be mistaken, this isn't worship. The Spirit isn't worshipping Jesus. Rather, it's an attempt to gain authority over Jesus. To know the name of another and then to use it showed that you had power over them. The Spirit was trying to influence Jesus by showing that they knew the name of Jesus and were asserting authority over him. And to illustrate this, I remember a time when my mum was shopping around for a brand new car. Um, the car salesman kept saying, Mrs. Ferguson. Would you like uh, to add insurance, Mrs. Ferguson? Uh, what about these, Mrs. Ferguson? Uh, would you like a free mug with this overpriced insurance, Mrs. Ferguson? What about mats, Mrs. Ferguson? What about a full tank of fuel, Mrs. Ferguson? He kept using her name over and over and over again because he was trying to gain influence over her decision making. Thankfully, I was with her and I was having none of it and a good deal was struck up and certainly my name was never used. The evil spirit was trying to show power and influence over Jesus by stating his name and identity. And then we have the reason as to why they're doing this. The spirit was afraid of the worst that Jesus would torment them or destroy them or at the very least cause them great harm. This wasn't a spirit worshipping Jesus. This was the spirit being concerned about their position, self-focused rather than worshipping Jesus. Before moving on to verse 9, notice that the spirit disobeys Jesus. Don't get lost in their kind of influence and the power battle and miss this. 
They disobeyed Jesus. They did not come out of the man as Jesus commanded. They remained in the man and instead tried to influence Jesus so that they would gain power in the situation. But like me and the car salesman, Jesus was having none of this. Verse 9. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. And Jesus knew that this man was possessed before he had even gotten to him. And I'm pretty sure Jesus already knew the name of the spirit because he's the son of God. He knows all things. So this wasn't about gaining information. I believe that Jesus was turning the power play around and showing that he is in fact in control. A simple question will lead to a simple answer. And so the name of the spirit is Legion. And we're told that is because there is more than one spirit. In fact, there are many. A legion would be a division of 3,000 to 6,000 soldiers in the Roman army. So the name is given hint to the condition of the man, that he is possessed by literally thousands of evil, unclean spirits. And they have such a hold of him that the man requests that they stay in him. Look at verse 10. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. The man who is possessed is begging Jesus that they remain with him. They have such a hold on him that they've changed his way of thinking. They are in control of this man. But they're going to soon learn that they're not in control of Jesus. Verse 11. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside and they begged him saying, send us to the pigs, let us enter them. So he gave them permission and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs. And the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and were drowned in the sea. The demons want rid of this weak human that they inhabit. So they begin a, a bizarre negotiation with Jesus for them to enter a nearby herd of, of 2,000 pigs. For a moment, just ignore the pigs, just for a second here, and see the beginning of verse 13. Jesus gave them permission. Notice that Jesus has the authority in this situation. He is the one that holds the power. He is the one that the spirits have to ask to leave this man. It is Jesus, the Son of God, who has the influence and who has the power as to where these spirits will end up. And so with the permission of Jesus, they come out of the man and into the pigs. The pigs being overcome, rush towards the sea and drown in the sea. Absolutely horrendous for the pigs, but liberating for the man who was once possessed. Verse 14, the herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country and people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon possessed man, the one who had legion sitting there, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who owned the herd of pigs saw all that had happened and went and told anyone that would listen to them. They went into the countryside and into the cities, telling people that this demon-possessed man that they all knew about was healed and how the spirits had left, went into the pigs and had drowned the pigs. Naturally curious, a, a crowd comes to Jesus. And yet another sign that people were not always drawn to Jesus, but drawn to the work that he did. A testimony of a changed life or a, or a dramatic situation draws people in. And what did they see when they arrived? Well, remember verse 4 and 5, and I said there would be a contrast. Verse 4 and 5 showed us that the man was overpowered by the spirits, that he wailed and cried all day and all night long. He was segregating and he was self-harming from the, the influence that the spirits had over him. But now look at him in verse 15. He was sitting still now fully clothed and in sound mind. The man was no longer possessed. Legion was no longer within him. Jesus had healed this affliction. Rather than jump for joy and worship for Jesus on this news and on this witnessing, instead the people were afraid. They didn't like the outcome that they had witnessed. Verse 16. 
And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. They wanted rid of Jesus. Something about the whole ordeal terrified them. They were struck, awestruck by Jesus. But they wouldn't humbly worship him. Instead, a mob gained around Jesus and they demanded that he leave their region. It's really interesting, actually, that they're showing the same signs of the religious leaders at the end of chapter 3 and in chapter 4. Something about what they had seen caused them to fear. They left, declaring that they wanted Jesus out of the region. Just because you have seen something great doesn't necessarily induce faith. You're not necessarily drawn to faith in Jesus just because you have seen a miracle. Because the miracle is a starting point. The Holy Spirit is needed to work and draw the soul of that individual into Jesus. And so clearly these individuals have rejected the calling of the Spirit, the prompting of the Spirit. And instead, rather than going to faith, They have gone to fear and have cast out Jesus from the region. Well, what about the man that was healed? Verse 18. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged that he might be with him. And he did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone marvelled. The man was now committed to following Jesus. He wanted to know more of Jesus. He wanted to travel with Jesus. He wanted to witness the more miracles. He wanted to hear the teaching of Jesus. He wanted to follow Jesus. However, Jesus had other plans. The task was to go and witness, (coughs) excuse me, to what had happened in the homeland and to his friends. Remember, this is the Gentile country. They are non-Jews. They don't have scripture. They don't know about the promise of Jesus. They don't know about the Messiah. They don't know about Jesus coming to save sinners. And so this man preached in the Decapolis, the, the 10 major cities in the area. And when he did, people were amazed and astonished at the one they called Jesus. Once a demon possessed man, now a healed preacher of the gospel, that Jesus changes lives and heals even the worst. It really is a wonderful story, isn't it? Unfortunate for the pigs, and yes, several rejected Jesus, but you cannot help but marvel at the power and authority of Jesus and the subsequent gospel ministry into a land that had never heard of the love of Jesus. So what are we to take off this? How do we find relevance from this passage and apply it to our own lives? Well, here's just a few quick thoughts. Number one, Jesus has the authority. At no point in the narrative did the Spirit overcome or win against Jesus. Jesus always had the authority. They ran to Jesus. They answered to Jesus. They asked permission from Jesus. And it was Jesus who had the authority to give the permission. I think many of us, specifically those who follow Jesus, walk around forgetting this fact. We are overcome by the stress of life and so we seek answers. And we try to get them from our colleagues, our families, our leaders, our government, self-help books, and any number of self-focused ways to get an answer to the stresses of life. And the reality is that nobody and nothing has the authority over your life except from Jesus. Now, you may battle him and you may reject him, but you cannot overpower him. Jesus is the Almighty, not you and not anyone or anything that you turn to. Matthew 28, 18 says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Do you see that? That all authority in the heavenly realms, in the eternal life, has been given to Jesus. All authority on this earth and over all things on this earth has been given to Jesus. 
he is the one that has the answers. He is the one that has the authority. And the problem is we often think that our opinion matters or that we know best or that our life, our resources, our skills and our abilities are ours to figure out. Elizabeth Elliot wrote, until the will and the affections are brought under the authority of Christ, we have not begun to understand, let alone accept his lordship. Let me encourage you today, stop trying to run the show. Stop trying to follow the loudest voice or leading the, the greatest influencer of our time. They are nothing compared to God. Submit to Jesus, truly submit to Jesus by giving him your affections and your desires. And in so doing, Jesus will take his rightful place as Lord over all of your life. The second thing I want you to see is to be led to faith, not fear. We have two responses in the narrative today. Faith from the man healed and fear from those who witnessed. And I think in our current time, fear is on the increase. Questions are being left unanswered and we are against a fairly unknown situation with little weapons or armour to protect us. We can be led to uh, believe that the only response we can give is fear. And I want us to, uh, to recognise and be encouraged today that fear is not the answer, but faith is. Psalm 56 from verse 3 says, When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? When David wrote this, he was near certain death. Just like us, he had no weapons and no armour. Although he knew who his enemy was, again, just like us, he could not see them, nor could he know where they were because they lurked in the darkness and in the shadows. However, when fear came knocking, David chose not to fear. Instead, he turned his eyes to God and turned his life to faith. In trusting God, his fear left and it was replaced with the praises of God, for he realised that God had all authority and that no one could harm him because God was the one in control. Friends, it's good to stay safe these days, but it's not right to be fearful. For God has your life in his hands. He is the mighty fortress and a stronghold around you. He is the one who has authority. He is the one who has never been overcome. Turn your eyes to Jesus and trust in him because in so doing you'll be led from fear to faith and you will be able to face the trial ahead of us. If you're finding yourself more fearful and overcome by it, look all the more intently to Jesus. And if you're finding yourself increased in faith, then tell others and lead others to look to Jesus who brings peace, who brings hope and who brings protection to those who are afraid. And finally, you play a part in the kingdom of God. I should probably rephrase that and say all of us play a part in the kingdom of God. Remember the ending of the story. The man healed wanted to be with Jesus, but Jesus sent him on a task to preach about what he had witnessed, the good news that Jesus heals and saves. Either way, whether Jesus, with Jesus or in his own land, the task was always going to be the same, to bear witness to the gospel found in Jesus. The key lesson, though, is that this can be done in many ways and in many places. We are all called to be witnesses of the gospel, to, to preach the good news of Jesus, but we're not all necessarily called in the same way to the same place at the same time. If you're watching this and you're a believer, let me be clear, God has a part for you to play in his kingdom expansion. I guarantee you it will have something to do with the gospel, but I can't tell you where it will be, when it will be, how it will happen, and what time, location and place it might be. That is between you and God, but I can guarantee you it is going to be gospel ministry because that is what we are called to do. The Great Commission, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son and Spirit, and then teach them all the words of God. 
This is our task, the task of a lifetime, the mission field of taking the gospel as far and as wide as we possibly can. A good example to follow would be that of Catherine Booth. It was said of her, wherever she went, in the houses of strangers as well as of friends, in the meetings great and small, when she was welcomed and when she was not, whether alone or with others, she laboured to lead souls to Christ. I have known her at one time to spend as much trouble to win one as at another to win fifty. You can follow her example in that. Friends, commit to Jesus. Find faith in him. Then do your part and work tirelessly to bring more souls to Jesus. Let's close our time in prayer. Father, we thank you that you healed this demon-possessed man. We thank you for his faith that he found in you and for his eagerness to share the gospel. Father, help us be like that man. Help us be eager to share the gospel in new ways. Help us do our part for your kingdom. Help us not be like the crowd who turned into a mob and who questioned you. Father, instead, turn us from fear to faith. And Father, we pray as we do so that we will find blessing, peace, hope, love, mercy, grace in your name. And that as we do so, many will look upon our changed lives and ask that question, who is this Jesus who has changed your life? So Father, bless us in gospel ministry and expand your kingdom through our work and through our part that we play in your kingdom's work. We pray this in your name. Amen.